As we near the end of our study of infinite series, we're building toward a big application involving what are called Taylor series or Maclaurin series. And before we get to those, we need to talk about a general category of a type of series called a power series. Now a power series introduces something new. All of the infinite series we've dealt with so far have simply had constants being added or subtracted together. This is our first introduction to a series that involves a variable. So if we have an x introduced, and specifically x raised to the power of k, then that's the key to a power series. That's the main feature of a power series. So let me show you a simple example. Let's say we just have the series x to the k. So when k equals 1, the first term would equal x. When k equals 2, we have x squared, and then x to the third, and so on. Now the key to this kind of series is that if we ask the question, does this series converge or diverge, the answer depends on the value of x. So that's the main point to take away so far is that the convergence or divergence of a power series depends on the value of x. For instance, trivially, if x equals 0, you would have 0 plus 0 squared plus 0 cubed and so on would all equal 0. So pretty easily you could tell that that converges. But if you had 1, for instance, you would have 1 plus 1 squared plus 1 cubed plus 1 to the fourth. So if x equals 1, you would just have 1 added to itself infinitely many times, that would diverge. And of course if x was 2 and so on, it would still diverge. So the convergence and divergence depends on the value of x. So some values of x will make the series converge, some values of x will make it diverge. And the main goal with the power series is to answer the question, what values of x make this converge. So that's our goal. When we use a power series, when you encounter one, the question will be what values of x make this converge. So let me introduce some terminology. When we find the values of x that make this series converge, we will discover that a series will converge for values in some interval. In other words, there will be a range of values that fall into a specific interval, and that interval will make the series converge. So we call this interval the interval of convergence. For instance, for a specific example, we might find that the interval of convergence is from 2 to 5. So that means x values between 2 and 5 make it converge, and all other x values make it diverge. So again, that's the main question, finding this so-called interval of convergence. You may also see the term radius of convergence, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, and how that connects to this interval of convergence. But it turns out to be related based on where this interval is centered, and then how far the interval spreads out from there. So when it comes to finding this interval of convergence, again, that's our main goal. The nice thing is that we only have to worry about one test to make this work. So for the interval of convergence, we're always going to use the ratio test. And if you remember, when we talked about the ratio test, we talked about how it was useful for things involving powers of k. So of course, when we see a power series, that's why the ratio test comes in handy. So let me show you with this simple example how we can find the interval of convergence. So let's take the series x to the power of k. And we'll apply the ratio test to this series. So we'll take the expression x to the k, and if you remember the ratio test says, let's define this value p, 
that's the limit as k goes to infinity of the k plus 1 term divided by the k term. So it's this ratio of subsequent terms. So in our example here, a sub k is x to the k, and a sub k plus 1 would be x to the power of k plus 1. Now this, of course, simplifies nicely. If you have x's on the top and the bottom and you start canceling them, since the degree on the top is one higher, once you're done canceling, you'll be left with simply x inside the absolute value signs. Now notice that when we're taking a limit as k goes to infinity, this expression here doesn't involve k whatsoever, which means that as k goes to infinity, that sees no change, and so the value of that limit is simply the absolute value of x. So because there's no value of k in that expression, we're just left with the absolute value of x here. And if you remember, for the ratio test to work, the ratio test says this converges whenever p is less than 1. If p is greater than 1, it diverges, and if p equals 1, the test is inconclusive. So we say, okay, the absolute value of x, that's what the value of p is, and that has to be less than 1. So it converges whenever the absolute value of x is less than 1. And it turns out, of course, that this absolute value equation, if the absolute value of x is less than 1, that means that x is less than 1 and greater than negative 1. So it lands between negative 1 and 1, where the values of the absolute value is smaller than 1. So this right here is the interval of convergence. Almost. So we aren't quite done yet, because if you remember, when p equals 1, this test is inconclusive. So we know this series converges for all values of x greater than negative 1 and less than positive 1. We know it diverges for all values of x less than negative 1 or greater than positive 1. What we don't know is whether it converges or diverges when x equals 1 or equals negative 1. So because the ratio test is inconclusive when p equals 1, meaning when the absolute value of x equals 1, or when x equals 1 or negative 1, we have to test those endpoints separately. And you'll see that with all these problems when we find the interval of convergence. You set up the ratio test and you get a conclusion like this one which gives you the interval, but what we don't know yet is what happens at the boundaries. So we need to check what happens when x equals 1 or when x equals negative 1. And it turns out this is usually pretty quick and easy. When x equals 1, we have 1 to the power of k. When x equals negative 1, we have negative 1 to the k. Now we could apply some test to these. For instance, on the left side, 1 to the k is just equal 1. And so if you add 1 repeatedly, of course that diverges. And very simply, it diverges based on the divergence test. Those terms are not going to 0. It's also sort of trivially true that if you add an infinite number of 1s, then you get infinity. So that diverges. Negative 1 to the k, you could apply the alternating series test, and the non-alternating part, it turns out, is also just 1. So again, it fails the divergence test. You could also just think about what happens here. As you start adding this together, you get negative 1 plus 1, which goes to 0, minus 1, which goes to negative 1, plus 1, which goes to 0. So that answer just bounces back and forth between negative 1 and 0, and never settles down or converges to anything. So these both diverge. So now we know that the interval of convergence is just between negative 1 and 1, strictly between those, not including the endpoints. 
So you might also say that the interval of convergence is the interval from negative one to one written this way. So you might write it in an interval notation or with inequalities. Either way is fine. But there's your first example of finding the interval of convergence for a power series. That's kind of a simple power series and all the examples that we do will follow this same pattern where we'll have the question what values of x make this converge? In other words, what's the interval of convergence? We'll always apply the ratio test and we'll get an interval where we'll have to test the endpoints separately.